听众朋友，你们好，欢迎收看夏威夷科学呃科技思想。Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. This is Alice Lee Hagen, and you are watching Business Education Spotlight. My earlier introduction was in Chinese, and of course the reason is my two guests today are Dr. Madeline Spring and Maya Lee. Both of them are from the University of Hawaii. Dr. Spring is the director of the UH. Uh, Chinese flagship language program, and Maya Lee is a freshman and a student ambassador of the flagship program. Welcome to our show, Dr. Spring and Maya. It's great to have you here. And excuse me, obviously I speak a little bit of Chinese, and uh, language has always been a very interesting, or something that I'm really interested in. And when I found out that you are actually directing the Chinese flagship program. Um, I thought this would be a great opportunity to learn more about the flagship program. So, but before uh, I guess I ask you a little bit more about this program, maybe producer, if you can show us the uh, the short video clip on the the language flagship, because I only knew that I only knew about the Korean and the Chinese flagship program, but I didn't know that it is a much bigger program than we know of. Let's uh, take a look at the video and then we can talk some more. Hi, Mark. As a flagship, I will not come to you. Come to your migilano and I will meet you. Joki ham ek saath parte hai. Apne pasand ke shak shak mat kare shay mein. كل البرامج تقدم للطلبة سنة كاملة لدراسة انغماسية وخبرة تدرس في الخارج. ماي لانجويج فلاجشيب كطالب علم هوني كناتي اطني جغال اونغا. وجان شانوي شاي دا شنشو سين جانية رينتا. بمستوى عال من لكفاءتي في اللغات الخارجة. إلى أمن بلدنا وتقدمها. Spring, this is a huge initiative, I guess, not um, in many campuses across the U.S. Can you tell us a little bit about the language flagship? As I said, I only know about the Korean and the Chinese, right. but our focus would be the Chinese. But um, if you could give us an overview. Sure. Well, the language flagship is a really fantastic initiative that started in 2002. Um, right now, it's grown, it continues to grow. Every time I turn around, it seems like there's another program that's been funded. Mm -hmm. Right now, I think there are 26 or 27 different programs on 22 campuses. And so there are uh, flagship programs besides Korean and Chinese. There's Arabic and Russian and Persian and Hindi, Urdu, and what am I missing? Turkish and Swahili and Portuguese. So uh, it's quite a range of languages. And basically, this, the model of flagship is the same mm -hmm. in all languages. So in all the programs, basically, there's an on-campus component and an in-country component. Okay. And the on-campus component, the goal is to get students to very high levels of linguistic um, performance, mm -hmm. proficiency, we call it. And we do a lot of assessment to see if they're actually reaching these levels that we think they're going to reach. We send them to places in Ch uh, for summer programs mm -hmm. so that they don't forget what they just learned mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. academic mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. um, and we really work with them. And then they, when we think they've kind of reached a certain level, we have what we call the um, kind of the pre-capstone year mm -hmm. for our advanced students. Mm -hmm. And that's really an exciting time for students to so I'm talking a little bit about my program now, but this is true more or less in all flagships. That at that last year is really intensive work, both in the language and also in other disciplines. So for example, this year, right now we have a class in anthropology in Chinese oh. that's being taught in Chinese for UH credit, oh regular anthropology class. Okay, and well, let's, let's pull back a little bit because um, now you said that there is anything from Russian to Swahili. So how, how would the flagship program determine and what started it off? Because I thought I read somewhere that it has, it has to do with the uh, Department of Defense. Is that correct? Right, right. So it's all funded mm -hmm. through the Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we are very lucky because the Department of Defense funding has remained more or less stable. Um, so this is not the kind of program where you get, uh, you write a proposal and you get a grant for two or three years and that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. It's really ongoing and um, a lot of the aspects of the program, you know, you don't quite believe it when you first hear about it. It can't be. You can't have a program like that. So we consider the languages that are chosen um, have been, cons uh, are on the list of the Department of Defense for languages that um, are what we call critical languages. Okay. Of course, all language is critical. Right. But <laughs> right. uh, these are the languages that have been determined to be critical for uh, well-being, America's well-being, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and that it's very important. I think after 9-11, uh, everyone in the government realized that Americans uh, are very weak at learning language and learning language to any high level, and that's mm -hmm. kind of the way that this program was started. Well, I think at this point I'd like to bring in Maya because Dr. Spring, you mentioned that after 9-11 um, we realized that we're not very good with language. And Now, Maya, you um, grew up here and what made you, well, first of all, again, you're a student ambassador of the program uh, and you are currently a freshman in political science and you're also majoring in Chinese. Chinese. Yes, I'm and also majoring in Chinese language and okay. culture at UH. Oh, okay. Now, what drew you into Chinese and, yeah, what's, what got you interested in it? Well, I first started learning Chinese at Punahou School mm -hmm. as a middle schooler. So if I think back to the time as a middle schooler, it's hard to definitely pinpoint uh, the reasons why. But generally it's because I thought the linguistic aspects of the language were really interesting to me, the tones, the characters. It was a challenge. Um, I've always wanted, you know, to sort of push myself to achieve more and to um, learn about Chinese culture. I was, had an interest in Chinese history at the time. Mm -hmm. So during that, through my years in middle school and high school, and now at UH, um, I really enjoyed my time learning the language and all of its aspects. So how did you hear about, or how did you find out about the language flagship program then? So many different students had talked to me about the language mm -hmm. flagship. I had talked to some of my professors about it. And after having a conversation with Professor Spring mm -hmm. and hearing from other students in the program, I thought it was an amazing opportunity that I just had to take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And so I was really drawn to the fact that I could participate in tutoring. I could receive cultural literacy through the programs and events. Mm -hmm. And then also, obviously, the capstone year at the end, which is sort of an experiential learning um, component that really gives you the skills to reach a professional level of fluency. Because I knew as a student that just taking basic classes, going through 100, 200 level classes, even 300, wouldn't get me to that professional level of Chinese that I desired. And I guess hence um, the branding of this whole program is creating pr global professionals. Now, um, I can understand why Maya is a student ambassador. Uh, I would love to hear you go out and talk to high school students because as I said, language, um, I love languages and I think uh, in a global economy of ours, everyone should speak a second language, Definitely. if not third or fourth. But now going back to you, Dr. Spring, I know you came to this program last year in August, I believe. Right. And uh, prior to that, uh, you were with uh, Arizona State University, also running their language flagship program and also their ROTC pilot program in, right. in Chinese as well, right. correct? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess with your experience and having been here for, I guess, close to almost a year, um, mm -hmm. so how how are you doing how, uh, how is the program well the program is growing very quickly um, I think that we kind of wanted to just not make the same mistakes that people make in the early stages in many developing many flagship programs and so we've we've jumped right in what, what kind of mistakes did they make uh, well I think it's really important that the program work very well with the department mm -hmm. so we have a very supportive um, the EALL East Asian language and literature department mm -hmm. here which is huge mm -hmm. uh, is very supportive the chair is very supportive and that makes a big difference so we're kind of situated right in the department which 
means that we are really, we feel like we're really integral to what's going on in the whole Chinese language program. Mm -hmm. So I think that Chinese language flagships, if they're off isolated in a silo somewhere, it's, it's great for a few students, but it's not going to have too much impact. So what we really want is for this to have lots of impact on actually all languages, all language learners. Mm -hmm. So if you can see little parts of the program that you can do in Chinese, why not try doing it in Russian? Or why not try doing it in Samoan? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, another language? Because mm -hmm. really some of the, a lot of the pieces of the program don't require grant funding. It's kind of requires thinking outside the box a lot. Mm -hmm. And universities don't generally promote that kind of thinking. But we're getting there, and UH oh, has good. been very responsive. Now, you said earlier on that you were actually trying to run a course, or perhaps a course is ongoing uh, anthropology in Chinese. Right. So how many students do you have in that class? That class, it's small, uh -huh. um, because this is our first year. Mm -hmm. I think I, um, I was very, well, I am ambitious. So I was very ambitious, mm -hmm. thinking that we would just start at both levels. So mm -hmm. we'd start at the top with the most advanced students that we could could find somehow who had been been through the program mm -hmm. through um, high level of language classes mm -hmm. or were heritage learners who mm -hmm. just happened to be interested in improving their language mm -hmm. and then at the same time we were starting with lower level students mm -hmm. uh, who are going up so mm -hmm. this higher level um, it's a little bit been a little bit of a challenge mm -hmm. to get everybody on board but we are sending our first student to the capstone year which is great uh, so we, we have this, there's pretty slow, low enrollment in that class, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. about six or seven students. Mm -hmm. um, it's also open to students, other students who are interested in taking this class and who are at that level. So there are some students who are graduate students. There's one student who is uh, Vietnamese mm -hmm. and she wanted to improve her Chinese. Wow, so crazy. it's, it's uh, you know, there are, it's open to more people. Mm -hmm. And next year we have some really fantastic classes lined up. So oh, in the fall, like we're teaching a class in Chinese musicology that uh, also will be taught. All these classes are taught completely in Chinese. Mm -hmm. The papers are written in Chinese. Everything wow. is in Chinese. And then next uh, year from now, so spring 2016, we'll be teaching a class on Chinese economics. Uh, an economics professor who normally teaches the class in English will be teaching the class in Chinese. Oh, that's fantastic. And, yeah, so, th so that's great. So these instructors, they are all here in Hawaii. They are. D you, you didn't have to fly anybody in here? No. Wow. The only, <laughs> well, we did fly one person uh -huh. in, so uh -huh. our, our uh, flagship instructor, we have one dedicated flagship instructor mm -hmm. That's basically, um, you know, the grant pays for her salary. Mm -hmm. uh, the grant, actually, the grant and the college pay for her salary. Mm -hmm. And um, we flew her in from Oregon. She had been working with flagship mm -hmm. at University of Oregon, and mm -hmm. I picked her up the first day of classes in the fall. Oh so wow! We just barely got her in, but she's been wonderful. But everybody else is from Hawaii and has been here. Well, I guess it um, shows that we do have the language diversity here, definitely, and um, definitely. we really should take advantage of that. But now, Maya, I don't suppose you're taking the anthropology class no. <laughs> and not the musicology one. Tell eventually. Oh, eventually. <laughs> I'll really? Get there. I'll, wow. I'll get there. I'll get there. Um, tell us some of the classes that you've been at and what, what's, your, what's the experience like? So I'm a freshman mm -hmm. right now at UH, so I'm just starting out. I am in Chinese 202 now, which is intermediate mm -hmm. level Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, this summer, I'm actually going to be studying at an institute at Indiana University oh, to okay. take my whole 300 level uh, of Chinese in an eight-week course. So that will push me to studying the 400 wow. level. <laughs> <laughs> That's a short period of time, in my though. sophomore year. Okay. Yes, it's a short period of time. Uh, it's incredibly intensive. Mm -hmm. You take a language pledge, which means we pledge to not speak any English at all through the entire duration. So we won't be hearing any English. Um, we'll be living in Chinese, mm -hmm. working in Chinese, mm -hmm. four hour long days of okay. instruction and one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It's it's a lot, but it's to get to that high level. So wow, that's amazing. But but why Indiana? Um, now, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I know you talked about the Capstone project where they will have to go um, presumably to a Chinese university, So, but why, why, why Indiana? Well, Indiana has a Chinese flagship program mm -hmm. at their university mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So they offer an institute in the summer for students who want to learn 200 level mm -hmm. and 300 level Chinese. But we also have many other programs 
that our students from the University of Hawaii are attending during the summer. So we have the ACC program in Beijing, which students from the UH are attending this summer, and other programs in China as well for higher level students. Oh, great. Now, we are coming on a first break, but after the break, I'd like to ask you more about perhaps some of the opportunities and maybe it's too early to ask, but some of the challenges. So uh, yeah, we'll take our first break. My guests are Dr. Madeline Spring, director of the Chinese language flagship program at the University of Hawaii Manoa, and Maya Reed, who is a freshman at the university, also a student ambassador of the program. You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. We'll be right back. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese How dance, is the pace of it okay. vigorous physicality, Timeless yes, stories. Yes. 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance. Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on the Think Tech Digital Series. The show is every Wednesday from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And I want you to watch this show because I think that when we talk with artists on the show about what they do, how they do it, and most importantly, why they do it, I believe that it resonates within each of us and we find something inside of ourselves that brings us closer to all of humanity. That's what arts are there to do and that's what I'm here to do on this show. It's center stage. Okay, it's on every Wednesday from right 2 to 3 o'clock. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My name is Alice Lee Hagen. If you're just joining us, my guests today are Maya Reed, who is a University of Hawaii freshman, uh, also a student ambassador at the uh, Chinese language flagship program, and of course, Dr. Madeline Spring. Uh, she is a distinguished Chinese professor, also the director of the Chinese language flagship program. So, well, we were talking about this huge program that was developed via the uh, Department of Defense, and of course the focus here is on Chinese, uh, while I know that there are a lot of other languages that are being taught across the country. So Dr. Spring, if you could tell us, um, I know this is a fairly new designation, right? The mm -hmm. Chinese language mm -hmm. flagship. I, could you tell us a little bit more about how, how you each got that designation? Yeah, so um, I think that the, the programs in Chinese, the, the language with the most programs mm -hmm. is Chinese. Mm -hmm. So there are 12 programs in Chinese right now uh, around the country. And um, they didn't all start at once. So it started with two programs, and they added another one, and they added another one. And then there would be like a call for proposals. Mm -hmm. People would write up proposals. Um, there's a very serious vetting uh, situation where they you know, meet and decide who's going to, what proposal sounds like it's most feasible. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be a time when you put effort into doing that particular program. So for example, I was at Oregon, and then when we started that program, I took leave from University of Colorado, and went to Oregon for a year and a half, and that was the first K through 16 program. Um, and that was, I think, the fifth flagship program uh, in Chinese. So, so now there's seven more wow. that have started since then. So the Hawaii one, um, it was last year, there was a call for proposal. So, uh, and they were going to fund two programs. Mm -hmm. And I think they had pretty specific goals in mind. They wanted programs that already had very strong language programs mm -hmm. and so that they would be able to, to, they weren't going to be building a Chinese language mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. So there are some flagships that started, they wanted, they experimented starting from zero. Oh, and then this one, they really wanted to see if it would take off where it was going. So um, I was not here then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was at Arizona mm -hmm. State mm -hmm. University. Mm -hmm. The people here put together a proposal right. and it was selected. University of Minnesota was the other place that oh, was chosen, okay. so we are the two newest programs. Which one is the oldest program? The oldest, oldest Chinese, Chinese program like is Brigham Young University and they have quite a large, a large program, very um, 
well-run program and every program is different okay. so it's not that's one of the things that I think is very attractive to mm -hmm. educators mm -hmm. that you design the curriculum mm -hmm. the goal is the same for everybody mm -hmm. and the last part is the same for everybody so the students will all end up together yeah. in China uh -huh. it's but it's kind of like what's the pathway that you're gonna get there it's gonna be different so BYU does a lot more individual oh. uh, work Mm -hmm. with in terms of uh, content they don't have like content courses like we do with anthropology or economics oh. they do it more one-on-one -on -one, oh. depending on the students interest so they do that a little bit differently every place does it a little bit differently um, the, uh, producer is oh perfect <laughs> you read my mind now I know this is a picture I think Maya you are in the yeah, picture okay uh-huh so when was this picture taken, and is the student size about this? And no, it must be a lot more right so now, right? So it's definitely a lot more uh -huh. than that. This uh -huh. was at Paimana Beach Park, and okay. we had an event, a get-together. Mm -hmm. There were visiting students from the flagship main programs in Nanjing and um, Tianjin. Mm -hmm. yes. Teachers. Yeah, mm -hmm. teachers, mm -hmm. professors who had come to visit us, mm -hmm. and we just had a nice picnic to show them the beauty of Hawaii there. Oh, okay. So you mentioned Tianjin and Nanjing. So these are our partner universities right. there? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, now, I know earlier on before the break, you were talking about the flagship program that um, I guess the lesson learned is that it's not a program kind of tucked away somewhere at the university. So I imagine buy-in from the top is really, really important. Yeah. And I know that you mentioned also that EALL has been really supportive. Um, I'd like to play a video clip about some of the things that, well, not our um, uh, administrators at UH said, but I guess some other places, they talked about why this is an uh, in, important uh, undertaking. So, producer, can I ask you to roll that tape on the aspiring global professional? These will be not only our ambassadors of the future, but they will be our ambassadors in business, ambassadors in science, ambassadors in culture. We don't need a few hundred, we need thousands and thousands and thousands of individuals with these capabilities, and the flagship program builds the platform to make that happen. Global professional really means being top-notch in your field and discipline but also being able to use language when you're working in that discipline. These are languages of future commerce, future cultural exchanges, uh, future learning environments. Parents are looking for opportunities for their students to excel in a very tough job market. Part of the advantage that the flagship students have is they spend their entire college career integrating high-level language skills with their major. And then they spend time overseas in an internship and direct enrolling in their topic area at a foreign university. I hope to focus on Muslims in America. I feel that I'll be able to use Arabic in the workplace when I'm dealing with real issues and real problems. I would like to work as a financial reporter. As a Chinese and supply chain double major. I'm very interested in working in the foreign service. My interest is in modern Arab intellectual history. I am shamelessly an, an aspiring academic. I would like to go into media, television, news in India. Flagship is helping me uh, accomplish my career goals, which are to go to medical school and then graduate and go open a chain of clinics in India. I want to do my capstone year in Syria. And when I return, I hope to go to law school and I want to study immigration law. I want to graduate with a business degree and a Hindi Yudu flagship degree and go on to get a job in international banking. Of course, Maya, what would you like to do um, with your language proficiency in Chinese? What are your dreams? Yeah, so as we discussed at the beginning of the program, I'm a double major at un the University of Hawaii, so I'm majoring in political science as well as Chinese. And so that also drew me to the program, the fact that I could also focus really intensely on my other in academic interests in addition to studying Chinese. Mm -hmm. So my goals for the future, I'm really interested in international relations, mm -hmm. and my future goals would be to work in global development or possibly business possibly so 
being able to take classes in Chinese and economics and business and government and law um, is another amazing part of the program. It is great, and uh, I guess when I first came here to Hawaii, well, uh, because prior to coming to Hawaii, I was actually in Canada, and at that time, when people know that I spoke Chinese there, it really didn't mean much, but when I came here, it made such a big difference, and I guess in just that short 10 years' time, um, the value of being able to speak Chinese, I think uh, people are more aware of that, and. I, I think it's actually a good idea. And I think I read somewhere there was an article that said that, uh, that said that you know a lot of different countries education system is in English and it actually um, there are some disadvantages to that. What do you think about that, Dr. Spring? Well, I think that um, you lose a lot in translation, mm -hmm. as they say. Mm -hmm. um, people really need the way that you open your eyes is mm -hmm. through a cultural lens. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for people to be able to look at things different ways. So this is true for all languages. Mm -hmm. And I think Hawaii is a perfect place. Um, and I know a lot of people are working very hard at getting more language uh, visibility mm -hmm. in uh, Hawaii. In mm -hmm. fact, there's this um, language roadmap that has been going on, really trying to connect uh, what's going on in the workforce with a person's ability, whether it's their heritage language or We're another language that, that they learn. These will be not People really, to be competitive, you really need to have another language. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, a great place to, for me to ask you. So what uh, what's the economic benefit mm -hmm. of somebody learning a second language I mean I'm I'm sold on the idea I, I have a son and I said okay you got to learn Chinese but for those people uh, and I know that people sometimes say well you know um, business language is English so why should I pick up a different language well I think biz it's uh, people who are savvy about business realize the advantage of mm -hmm. having somebody on their team who is uh, maybe it's in business who is uh, well versed in their company and what they're doing and what kind of contracts they have that might be going on, uh, and at the same time who understands what's going on. The Chinese or Japanese, whatever, mm -hmm. you can understand what they're saying rather than relying on their translator. So that's one important, mm -hmm. important piece. Mm -hmm. Also, it's important for people to understand the way the business ethic, the way that people carry out business, um, the way that people carry out, look at different kinds of issues, their morals, their values, mm -hmm. uh, and the language is really the way to find that out. Yeah. So it's fascinating mm -hmm. seeing students kind of change the way that they look at things once they start to see that maybe their perspective is just their perspective and it's not the right way. Now, um, I, I guess uh, you brought up the, uh, the language roadmap and I did an interview with um, the director, Dina Yoshimi, mm -hmm. I think it was August last year. We talked about the economic impact of um, people, well, the, yeah, economic benefit of somebody speaking additional languages. Do you know if there are particular professions that require um, certain languages that uh, that would be of benefit to them? Um, well, I think it depends on mm -hmm. the population. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, Spanish, medical uh, mm -hmm. Spanish is really important. Mm -hmm. To know because there's um, a lot of, a great need mm -hmm. in the medical situation there are a lot of Spanish-speaking people mm -hmm. um, here I would say that it's a wide range of languages but Chinese is inching its way up there mm -hmm. um, you know if you walk down Waikiki you hear Chinese all the time mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. a lot of the merchants there mm -hmm. um, are now telling me you know get me a student that speaks Chinese oh, so great. that we can hire them uh -huh. um, so I think that there are more and more opportunities uh, economically okay. And Maya, um, now outside school, have you had the opportunity to practice your Chinese? I've practiced a bit. Mm -hmm. I've had roommates in the past mm -hmm. who actually were from China, and I developed really close friendships, best friendships actually, from being able to understand them and sort of have that cultural awareness and cultural practices or customs that they shared as well. Mm -hmm. I've had chances in Hawaii to speak with tourists who have come to visit mm -hmm. and also 
in different volunteer situations. I was teaching English as a second language to East Asian immigrants who had come here as well. So it's been really useful for me, but I'm just starting out. I'm not at that sort of advanced level yet, but just even in this level now, it's, it's a benefit. Now, we're coming up on our second break, but I guess my question after the break for you is, well, um, learning a second language takes a lot of hard work. So I'm, I guess um, what your advice would be for younger people, um, why, why should they, yeah, wh what should they do if they are interested? So my guests are Dr. Madeline Spring, director of the University of Hawaii Chinese Language Flagship Program, and Maya Reed, also a student ambassador of the program, freshman at the university. We'll be right back. You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Here's the deal. Um, I'm Jay Fidel. I'm the host of uh, Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, which is the Energy Policy Forum's program on Wednesday. That's how we call Wednesday Energy Wednesday. We call it Energy Wednesday every Wednesday. Are you surprised? Okay, and we and we try to we get guys like Jim Alberts here from Hawaiian Electric who can tell us what's really going on in energy. We want to be informed. It's so important. It's the most important initiative in our state. Clean energy is major, okay? And that's why we cover it on this show. That's the deal. What do you think, Sharon? I think that's great. That's why we're here every Wednesday from 4 to 5, and we hope you all join us so we can hear people like Jim coming on our show and co-host Ray Starling from Hawaii Energy. Okay, Jim, you've been here today. You've seen this. You heard what she said. What do you think? I think it's a tremendous opportunity for people to come together and talk about the issues. Oftentimes there isn't a good forum to bring these key issues out into the public and this is a tremendous way to go about it. And the, the activity of this show is essential to keep talking about energy because as you said, it's such an essential part of our lives that we need to pay attention to it and we need to think about the future. Okay, Ray, your turn. Well, this is a special time in the history of Hawaii where we're making some pretty radical changes in the way we uh, use energy and generate energy. And this show is the one place you can count on coming to every Wednesday and hearing something about the latest issues that are on the table being discussed that will affect us all going forward. So. Uh, come join us, and if you have some ideas you want to share with us about energy, uh, give us a call and let us know. We'll we'll put you up here and uh, and let you talk for an hour. So uh, come see us. Thanks, Ray. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be from Think Tank's point of view. It's great to have this show. We love the show. It's our it's our most important show. <laughs> so come around and listen to us four to five on Wednesday. Thanks a lot. Bye. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome back to ThinkTech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My guests today are um, Dr. Madeline Spring and uh, Maya Reed from the University of Hawaii Lang uh, Chinese Language Flagship Program. Maya, before the break, uh, you were talking about your aspiration and you persisted in studying Chinese, which is a very, very challenging <laughs> language. So how did you do that and what advice do you have for our youngsters in the state? Yes, my journey learning Chinese was pretty difficult, I'd say. It's a challenging language for students who are living in the U.S. who haven't had any type of background with the knowledge, with the language. It was very difficult for me to learn at first, but I'd say even though it's a challenge, it's also incredibly rewarding. And for students who might think that, oh, they're just going to do the required courses for high school or, oh, they're just going to do the required courses for college, that they really think about how enriching foreign language can be for their lives and for their professional lives and also for their personal lives. Mm -hmm. And so I'd suggest for them to continue on in their language studies and step outside of the classroom, go to cultural events, get involved on maybe their campuses, hear from other students around them and keep up with it, watch videos, listen to music, um, sort of have a more holistic view and take on learning. That's great. Now, because someday um, with an additional language skill, a lot of the, the sky is limit. Um, so producer, can I ask you to show this video because I think it would hit home some of the things that people can do with um, 
being a language proficient. So let's throw this video here. Okay. I'm here. When people look at me, I, I say something <laughs> Thanks, to them. They have to take a double take and say, you know, is this guy, you know, speaking my language? We're not trying to create language majors, nor are we trying to create uh, translators. We're trying to create professionals who use the language in their daily life. NASA's work has become exceedingly international. We have about 453 agreements with 60 some odd countries. We've had just incredibly great experiences with each of the flagship participants that we've brought in. When I first entered the Foreign Service, I worked on political issues in Saudi Arabia, covering the first Good municipal job, elections okay. ever. And so there I had to use my Arabic to get out on the streets and talk with Saudis who were voting in the municipal elections. Wow, so these are two examples of what one could do or what one could achieve with foreign languages, working for foreign service and for technology companies. As I said, the options are wide open here. And I have to say to the two of you, I have so much respect for you to pick up such a difficult language because when I started learning English, I thought that was hard. Well, wow. <laughs> Chinese isn't that hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, Dr. Spring, do you get to use the language often too? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things about flagship is that mm -hmm. we really do work globally. Mm -hmm. So, we work with our partners. We've mm -hmm. got partners in China. Um, students in the capstone year, they go to China and they stud, they take courses in their interests. So she'll be taking a course probably pre-law, political science, mm -hmm. and doing some kind of an internship. An internship is also based on what the individual student is oh. interested in. Could okay. be in a museum, could be in a lab, could be in a law firm. So could that would be, be anything. In, in China? In China. In Nanjing? Or or it could, anywhere in China. Oh, really? So it can, wow. And from four to six months. So that really gives students a chance to see you know, they have to pay their own bills, they have to find their own apartment. Um, this is a really unique program where mm -hmm. students, there's a little bit of guidance, but basically they really are using their language and living the life of a professional. Wow, that's amazing. Um, now, the program is growing. Um, we are still trying to build the community support. Um, and I know that when we first started the program, it was with, I guess, our current uh, chancellor, right. uh, Robert, I'm sorry. Right, Robert. So would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, um, the chan new chancellor, he was the dean when I was first hired, um, is very excited about this program. And he very much wanted, wanted this program to be here. Mm -hmm. And that um, I think that has something to do with the reason why Hawaii was awarded the program. He's been going to flag annual flagship meetings for a lot of years, mm -hmm. and we've always had this mm -hmm. conversation about why not Hawaii, why not a Chinese program mm -hmm. in Hawaii, mm -hmm. so finally we have one and we're very thrilled about having this opportunity. So since um, Hawaii is one of 12 programs, do you do you meet with your counterparts on the mainland? Oh, we meet all the time. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> flagship is a very hands-on program, so I'm in communication with the people at the other flagships mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Yesterday I called, well actually I sent her an email since then about <laughs> something else. Mm -hmm. So I'm always in contact with people. I'm always in contact with people in China. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of meetings together. So uh, one of the things that's really neat is that People come from the uh, directors from each program get together um, in March to choose the students who will be going on capstone. So it's not oh. a given that you'll be able to go. You have to apply, uh -huh. and it's a very long application process. And we go through each of us goes through a very you know, look at every application and rate every student, and mm -hmm. then we get together and we talk about every single student, vote on every single student. So that's very innovative. And when you think about that, I can have an impact on a student at Rhode yeah. Island. Or, you know, someone from uh, Indiana or someone from Oregon has a, an impact on a student from Hawaii. That's not the normal way that a university runs. Exactly. Yeah, That's fantastic to hear about the collaboration yes. across the country. Now, Maya, as a student ambassador, do you get to meet some other, uh, some other uh, uh, of your fellow students from the other universities then? Um, I've met with lots of pers prospective students. Mm -hmm. We actually had a student who flew all the way from Georgia to come and meet um, mm -hmm. with our other student ambassadors mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. 
we've had a lot of different events on campus that integrated students from our particular program and also just students from the wider Chinese department, which is also very special. Mm -hmm. um, and especially through our capstone years and through our summer programs, all of us will get the chance to meet with other students. So another great part of the program is that students get to know these other students, even if they're from different universities, and we'll all be going to the capstone year, working together, attending similar universities, and being together in that wow. way. Now, um, you are a student ambassador, and I know you go out, talk to people, uh, go to talk to prospective candidates about the program. What, what else do you do um, as a student ambassador then? So as a student ambassador, I work with public relations and outreach is what, is what you described. Mm -hmm. We also help set up events on UH Manoa's campus. Mm -hmm. So recently we just had a Lantern Riddle Festival oh, okay. that where we put up events around our classrooms in Moore Hall. Mm -hmm. We've also met with other departments around campus and had meetings with them as well. Mm, wow. Uh, well, I hope to see more of those events. Now, coming back to you, Dr. Spring, I know that your expertise is in medieval Chinese literature, uh, specifically in literature of Tang Dynasty. Mm -hmm. And you, you're, you're also interested in, I guess, issues in teaching Chinese as a foreign language. But in your current position, you're still fa fairly new. So what vision do you have of the program and what can the community do to support your initiative? Well, I'm, I'm very lucky right now because I'm teaching classical Chinese, so I get to teach one of the things that I love to teach uh, and also um, kind of orchestrating this new program. Um, I'm, I really want to get more involved with the community. I'd like to set up a community advisory board, um, figure out something for scholarships and fundraising, which is really something that's important because we get scholarships for students, but it's not for the total amount. So there's always a little bit missing, and if we had some extra input from community mm -hmm. or something, that would really make a huge difference. So that's one of the things that I would really like to do. I'm, I was quite connected as uh, when I was director of the Confucius Institute at ASU, and mm -hmm. so I feel that gap I'm missing, you know, knowing everybody in the community. But I'm sure mm -hmm. it, it will take time, and it will happen. Right. So now you, you mentioned your experience at ASU at Arizona State University. Um, you've been the director at their program for a long time. So can you tell us what are some of the experience or things that they've done successfully that mm -hmm. you think you could try to adapt it for the program here? Well, um, one of the things we did was, you saw that video, we, we redirected that video so that it could be a video specifically about ASU by cutting out the parts that were taken on other campuses. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was a quick way to to get a video that was the same quality. So that's something that we need to work on. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, I had a fantastic team there that um, it took some time to build and we have a fantastic team here and we're working together. What I did have learned is that flagship really requires collaboration and uh, it requires collaboration on the instructor level and also in the administrative level. So that's something that we definitely have put into place here and are working on. Well, I guess the next step is really reaching out to the community. It is. It is. Um, now, I guess my last question too is, uh, I know, uh, Maya, you came through Punahou, so are you doing anything with the youngsters, uh, high school, mm -hmm. both in public and private school? Well, I'm glad you asked that, because one aspect of flagship is this program, uh, a separate scholarship, a separate uh, funded uh, program called F-L-A-N, so it's Flagship Languages, uh, a Language Acquisition Network. Mm -hmm. It's for actually Chinese and Portuguese. Oh. And really it has two strands. One strand is immersion education and one strand is uh, secondary schools. And we now, because we have this flagship here, we now are part of this group. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really reaching out to teachers um, of any kind who are teaching Chinese and we can see what we can do to share resources, get those teachers connected with the teachers on the mainland. Um, and I would really love to see some involvement in creating an immersion Chinese school. Mm -hmm. um, immersion education here in Hawaiian is very strong 
and I think this is a natural place for immersion in Chinese, uh, Japanese, Spanish. Um, that's really the way to go, and that's what's happening exponentially um, on the mainland. That's amazing, but there's a lot of work that have yet to be done. Definitely. So thank you so much, two of you, uh, for being my guests today. Maya, all the best with your uh, summer intensive course at Indiana University, and um, I guess we need to reach out more to the business community, Dr. Spring. Thank you thank for you. being my guest. Thank you, thank you for, for having, having us. us. <laughs> You've been watching Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My guests today are Dr. Madeline Spring, Director of the Chinese Flagship Program at the University of Hawaii, Maya Reed, Student Ambassador of the Flagship Program. Again, you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Please do join us next week. Aloha. Thank you, Zuri. Well, you're right. It goes really fast. Yes. Really fast. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened the time before, right? <laughs>